Alrighty, I think we're going to get started, everyone. So welcome to today's first annual on Myra College Teach-In. My name is Maria Antonio, and we are so glad that you join us today as we partner with thousands of organizations worldwide discussing climate solutions and justice in our local and global community. We hope today that you will enjoy this panel on climate and careers. Please remember that the goal of today is for education, discussion, and to search for solutions. Please keep the discussion kind and courteous, as always. Virtual attendees, please direct any questions that you do have through the chat. Um, I will be relaying those to the rest of the room. And then panelists, as we start, if you could just introduce yourselves and then give your introductions for today. Well, I guess I'll start because I'm closest to the end. I'm Autumn Watts. I'm a lecturer in writing here at Omar College. I have a background in cultural anthropology and an MFA in creative writing. So that's kind of where my that disciplinary perspective is coming from. We have a particular interest in issues of social justice and specifically gender. So I'll be focusing some of my talk on that today. Hello, everyone. My name is Abby Paulson. I am an assistant professor of biology here at Elmira College. And today I will be um, telling you all a little bit about um, how you can get involved in a career in sustainability or climate friendly um, green job. Um, let's see, and I think that I won't then have any experience. Hi, everyone. My name is Maria Faber, and I'm a professor of economics at the college. Um, so I'm going to basically speak. Uh, on this topic from the perspective of economics and just give you a little bit of a broad overview of how climate change is causing what economists call structural changes in the economy and what that means for the job market in general. I'm Rachel Redmond. I'm the director of the Center for Academic and Professional Excellence in Career Services here at Elmira. I spent the last 10 years working in career services in higher ed, um, which includes obviously prepping all of you students um, to go out into the workforce but also working with our recruiters and our employers to see kind of what's happening. So that's what I want to talk to you guys about today from my perspective is how has climate change impacted recruiting and what companies are looking for and then how you guys can have a voice in that as well. Perfect. Can everybody online hear okay? If you can't, please put in the chat. We'll make sure that our panelists can speak up. Um, but without further ado, if somebody wants to start us off for today, um, you are more than welcome to. Do we have one panelist on? We yes. <laughs> I'm Dr. Soti. I'm a pharmacology oh, faculty. Can you hear you one second here? Mm -hmm. Okay, try again. Can you hear me now? Does this need to be on? Like, uh, oh, maybe, you know, so that it's projected up there and people can see. I cannot see people up close. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Can you can you hear me? Yes, we are recording. Beautiful. Okay, try now. Can you hear me now? Can you hear me? Can you hear me now? Oh, it sounds like you came through. Try again. Can you hear me now? Okay, sorry guys. We're good now, sorry about that, thank you. Uh, can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, all right. Well, I'm Dr. Soti. I'm a pharmacology faculty at LECOM. Um, I will be talking about the impact of climate change on health today. All right, now we can be so sorry. <laughs> so I'll, I'll go ahead and get started. Perfect. We, yeah, yeah. We, we exchanged notes on the panel before. So um, I, I just decided, uh, thought that it would be a good idea to just provide some context 
um, on what the other panelists are going to give you specifics about. So um, I'm basically just going to sort of lay the groundwork for what climate change uh, means in terms of the structure of the economy and how that's changing and the impact that it's going to have on the job market as well. So um, I think it's fair to say that climate change it has already and it will continue to cause what economists call structural change um, in terms of economies around the world. Um, and the, 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 the change of the transformation has occurred and will occur as we transition to a low carbon economy. Um, and so that means, you know, from fossil fuel energy intensive to renewable sources of energy using climate friendly technologies um, and more sustainable modes of consumption. So I wanted to define what structural change means because some of you might not be familiar with that term. So economists basically use it to um, define transfer, how economies transform both in terms of industries and as a result of that in terms of jobs because of shifts that might be happening. They could be economic shifts, they could be due to technology. So um, examples would be if you think of most advanced industrialized countries like the US, that used to be primarily dominated by agriculture. And then in the 20th century, it was in the mid 20th century, it was manufacturing. And now we've moved into primarily a service oriented economy. So that means that both the products that we produce and the jobs that we have have changed, right? Um, we have fewer people working in factories and assembly lines and that sort of stuff, and more people engaged in service oriented industries. Um, another example would be what information technology uh, did in the 1990s. It caused a change in the way in which we do business. So climate change is sort of going to have that same disruptive effect, it, and it already has, but that's, that's what structural transformation or structural change refers to from the economic point of view. Um, so the, uh, you, can, you can also think of it as the knowledge and the skill sets that are going to be needed for future jobs are going to change as we, you know, um, as, as we have to use strategies both to mitigate and adapt to climate change. And that's going to kind of be spreading throughout, you know, jobs in all sorts of avenues um, in, in many sectors that you can think of. So I wanted to basically focus on four types of changes that might occur in jobs. Um, some of them will be pretty obvious. I mean, it, it's not going to be something that perhaps you haven't heard of. Some of them might be a little bit more subtle. So um, job creation, right? That's probably one of the areas where um, we would expect to see the most opportunities, especially for all of you, as you think about careers and things like that. Um, and a lot of job creation has occurred and will continue to occur in um, what we call green industries, right? Um, so green sectors would be, um, uh, you know, ones that uh, use renewable energies, new green products and services that are environmentally friendly and environmentally sustainable. So an example that came to mind um, that I've actually experienced um, is, especially with, if you think about tourism and you think about how tourism has also transformed over the, uh, over the years, um, and this is true, especially in developing countries. So sustainable tourism is a growing movement. Like a lot of tourists now are interested in, they're, they're mindful of their carbon footprint, right? This wasn't the case, uh, you know, a few decades ago. Um, and so um, that would be an example of uh, an industry that has transformed and the types of skills that you now need have changed as well. Um, job elimination, as you might, imagine would occur in primarily energy intensive and energy producing industries like oil, natural gas, um, uh, etc. right, as, as we shift towards more green uh, industries. Um, and then job substitution, jo job transformation kind of refers to, you know, that skill set that I was talking about, where we're going to have to adapt and um, uh, adopt new skill sets to deal with, uh, with uh, climate change. So I, th I think my time's about up, so I'm going to make sure that I'm <laughs> great. I don't know why. I was like, woo, that's good. <laughs> Beautiful. All right, anybody like to go off of that? I can jump in because um, okay. I think that's a nice segue to kind of what I'm talking about. Um, when we think about the changes in the economy, right? These are kind of the macro level. And now let's look at whether you're working in that industry or you're going into a totally different industry. I know we've got several education folks in the room. 
I'm not sure who exactly the line, but depending on what industry you're looking at. So um, I just want to talk about a little um, some, some stats. So in 2021, there's a Gallup poll that reported about 70% of US workers indicated that a firm's environmental record is important to them. So this has been a really big shift in the last few years. I know we talk about the millennial generation and Gen Z and all these different generations coming up. But this is a shift that's been happening within these generations where they're saying this stuff is important to us and it's important to us not only in our personal lives but in our professional lives too. So there's been this demand from employees that they want to see change. So I said, how, how does that happen and how is that then reflected from a recruiting standpoint? Our human resources department, right, and they're going in to recruit young folks or trying to steal people from, from other firms are saying, you know, we need to differentiate ourselves. We need to be able to speak to what are the values of these employees because those are largely what drive you to a career, right? Like what's important to you. So what are they doing? They're leveraging the sustainable practices and the recruiting material. You're going to start seeing more and more of that. They're going to talk about that in interviews of, you know, what's new. Um, when I coach you guys to, to look for, you know, doing your research on a company before you write your cover letter, before you go in for an interview, you're going to be looking at their mission, their vision statement, what's their branding. You're going to see a lot more of this climate work reflected in those, in those missions. And they know that because, again, it's important to this generation. So they want to, they want to hit those key points um, to draw you in. So hiring managers are being trained to be able to talk about the green initiatives, and you're also seeing more what we call a green teams. So more companies are having committees and green teams and opportunities for employees to become involved, to be able to get these shifts and, and movements um, in motion. So we'd be remiss to say um, that COVID hasn't impacted employment in general, right? Um, but we saw a lot of changes with COVID and the climate and employment. Right. So a few of these, I don't know if you guys remember, there's a lot happening, right? Um, if you remember like some of the, the global views of like smog being lifted in cities because people weren't driving to work, right? People have shifted to be working online. Um, fewer fossil fuels were consumed because of the commute. Wild animals were returning to city city states, right? Like all of these like wild kind of wild environmental things were happening. Um and that, I would say, has really accelerated this need. So there was already this demand from employees, but now like we're seeing this from a COVID perspective of this is actually doable in many industries. It's not doable in every industry, right? You can't stay locked down forever. But they're saying, where is the balance here? So that's why we see more you know, flexible work arrangements where maybe you work from home three days a week and you come into the office too. Some of our companies, you know, when we think of like the, the, the economics of it, right? We're talking about tech and some of these service industries. Some have just stopped having company locations altogether and everybody is remote. So the company is saving money and their employees are also not commuting. So again, many people who feel very strongly about climate change are saying, that's the kind of job I want. It could be work-life balance and all sorts of other things too, but we know it's having an impact on the climate as well. So like I said, there's, there's, there's several changes that are happening in, the, in that way. Um, there was an article from the site of Human Resource Management just in January of this year um, where they referenced when things have gone bad. So like what happens when employees say, you know, we're not happy with, with what's happening. And this happened at McKinsey & Company. Um, it was referenced, which is a large consulting firm, and they represent a lot of fossil fuel organizations. So about 1,000 employees signed a petition to change how they were being represented or how they were representing these, these firms. And they said, you know, this is really important to us as employees. We want to know who the clients that we're representing, how it's impacting our environment. So there's different ways that employees are finding a voice um, to change things from within, no matter what industry you're in, but also you know, having, having the option to say, this is what I want and being more selective. My last point on that is that I would be remiss in, in saying this, that there is some privilege in that too, right? That not everyone has the same access to work or the same needs, but it's something that, again, is, is shifting in our economy and it's shifting in the way we look at work. Um, so as, as our entry level, our next level of entry level employees are going um, out into the workplace, I would just encourage you to think about what's important to you and then figuring out how you can find your voice. 
Um, okay, so I think all of that we can do only if the people who are uneducated about climate change are made aware of the potential danger of climate change can cause. I mean, especially with the catastrophe the world has seen over the past two years because of COVID, uh, it has stressed the need that we need to discuss the, um, you know, the impact of climate change on health. Climate change massively impacts health. It triggers so many factors that can wreak havoc on humans and animals alike. And I'm not trying to sound alarms here. I'm just extremely concerned. The other day I was looking at the data and I found that uh, there have been rising premature births in Australia over the past three and four years because of increased sustained, sustained high temperatures. And I'm actually worried about another pandemic which might not be airborne like uh, COVID virus was. It could be waterborne the constant raining and flooding in some parts of the world and uh, droughts in the other parts of the world, actually it constitute the ideal weather conditions for waterborne pathogens uh, to spread. I'm also disturbed with the gradually increasing number of deaths due to heat. I mean, heat stroke is a real thing. It's just not that somebody's trying to fake it. Heat stroke, heat exhaustion, chronic kidney disease, you name it, heart attack. All those kind of things happen because of high temperature, and that's happening because of uh, climate change. Uh, extended summers with incredibly higher temperatures, making pollens to stay longer in air, and uh, exacerbating allergies, which can be fatal in some people. Uh, triggering asthma, who never had any asthma, and now they all of a sudden they have COPD, which is chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, or uh, even lung cancer have been attributed to massively uh, air pollutants. So I think we need to seriously look at it um, and form a consensus among people, those who actually do not know or do not believe or do not wanna know. Uh, we have to bring them to the table. We have to stop preaching to the choir, uh, especially on healthcare. You know, biodiversity is directly linked to healthcare. About 80% of the drugs that we have on the market, they, are, they come from plant origin. They are phytopharmaceuticals. Um, so we really need to make sure that, you know, we are making these jobs, but at the same time, we have to make people aware of the consequences first. Because once they are with us, we, they come along with us, then we can open different avenues. We can tell them, okay, this is uh, solar energy. This is wind energy that we can use. We, it could be green jobs and it would be better than the coal and other things, but we have to make them aware first because it poses massive healthcare burden on humans. I think that's what I wanted to say. Well said. Um, I guess I'll jump in next because I feel like what I have to say touches on all the other fields. I'll try to be brief. Um, I want to talk about gender and climate change because I think it's really important to consider when we think about these long ranging effects. Um, we already know that climate change has a greater impact on vulnerable populations, especially um, populations that rely on natural resources for their livelihoods, um, who are most vulnerable to droughts, famines, landslides, floods, hurricanes, and so on. So we know that it affects the poor most disproportionately, but the majority of the world's poor are women. And in fact, three-fifths of the world's one million poorest people are women. So they're especially at risk in climate-induced disasters. They most more often, and I'm talking globally, right? I'm looking across the world. They more often work in informal sectors that are most likely disrupted by climate disasters. Um, they're more impacted by diseases related to climate change, and they have more health risks tied to work in many cases. And they're also less likely to have the resources um, to survive and adapt these changes for a lot of different reasons, including structural inequalities, um, uh, gender roles, and so on. So in short, we can expect that women are going to take a harder hit than men overall in their livelihoods, and that more women than men will die as a result of climate change and disasters. So I'm going to 
to zoom in a little bit now and look a bit more at cities because a lot of attention has been on rural areas, the impacts of climate change and you know farmlands and agricultural regions. Um, but right now, about 54% of the world's population lives in urban centers and cities, and this is expected to increase to about 64% by 2050. And a lot of that is because of migration, people being displaced by climate change and other factors. Um, so conflicts, which we can expect to increase as a result of climate change and so on. Um, and again, as has been pointed out, cities themselves can be heat sinks, heat deserts. The nature of the pavement, the nature of the structure, the lack of green spaces it actually makes it hotter and more dangerous for heat risks, as I already mentioned. But not everybody is impacted in cities the same way. We already know that it's linked to gender, age, range, and income, to how vulnerable you are, how negatively you're impacted. And again, the poorest urban inhabitants tend to be women. Um, as an example, in Southeast Asia, the largest slum is the Tondo district in Manila, which is especially prone to typhoons and flooding. And 80% of the adult slum dwellers are women, which is crazy. Um, so because of the social barriers, and also women tend to have more childcare and elder care responsibilities, um, they often have to take poorly paid, riskier jobs um, that are gendered. And I've got several examples of this, I'll just keep moving along, because I can just go on and on about it. Um, so I want to now shift to the nexus of gender and climate change policies, which is not getting enough attention in the conversation. Um, many cities are currently trying to develop and implement strategies for tackling climate change, but local governments tend to fail to attend to gender issues or integrate a gender responsive approach in their planning. Um, and this is largely because women are underrepresented in all levels of policy making, both from national levels and local levels. So, for example, worldwide, women represent about 20% of city councilors and only 5% of mayors worldwide. And of the world's 34 megacities, these are cities with populations over 10, 10 million, um, the only, only three of them are female mayors. Um, so this obviously affects baby anthropic and climate issues, um, in which they're often disproportionately affected. Oh my gosh, I'm so behind the time. Okay, um, so I'm going to zoom ahead then to saying that um, cross mainstreaming of climate change and gender is aiming to transform cities into low carbon, resilient, gender just, and inclusive communities, which not only helps address social inequalities, but also helps unlock the potential for women to participate, which leads to greater success overall in these efforts. Um, specifically with careers, women are right now underrepresented in the green economies. Um, and so, you know, these have opportunities for new jobs, reskilling, and so on. Um, and also women bring many, many assets. They tend to have more knowledge in local resources. They also are the ones who manage the household resources. Um, they can be excellent community partners. They're just being underused right now. And so some ways to improve this overall thinking ahead as you go into positions of power or authority, or as you are also considering fields for yourself, um, more training and support in STEM fields, sustainability fields, um, making sure women are represented equally and reskilling. So shifting from the old economies to the new economies, making sure women are included in that transition, um, championing women's entrepreneurship. I have a lot of really exciting examples of ways that women-headed organizations are doing really cool and amazing things that are really helping bolster not only the local economies, but also their sustainability over time. Um, so I'll be happy to talk more about those as well, but I think I'm out of time, so I'll just <laughs> stop myself there. Beautiful. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Uh, so today I'll be speaking a little bit about how you, if you are so inclined, can get involved in a career in, in sustainability or in the green economy. So um, a lot of you in the audience today are at this very exciting point in your lives where you know, you're thinking about um, what career you'd like to have and what you'd like to pursue. Um, and there's so many you know, amazing options that are coming up in um, the field of um, sustainability and green jobs. So it's a really exciting time to be um, a person looking to um, pursue some of those careers. Um, and one thing that I wanted to mention is that um, you all are already off to a good start with that. 
you know, um, doing your best working on the bachelor's degrees here is an excellent first start for lots of different careers in the green economy. So lots of people think about the green economy as just being like science, engineering, environmental science jobs. Um, and those are probably the jobs that leap to mind when you think about it. jobs in renewable energy, jobs in conservation and forestry and soil science and agriculture and sustainable building and, you know, civil engineering, that kind of thing. Um, but one thing I wanted to mention is that um, there are lots of jobs springing up across the board in lots of different sectors that, um, you know, involve um, climate friendly um, you know, jobs. So some that I found through um, doing some research over the past little bit here are, there are um, lots of opportunities right now in business. Um, so lots of business schools are now offering sustainability MBAs in addition to regular MBAs. And with a sustainability MBA, they um, teach students about a triple bottom line where you're thinking about economic, environmental, and social sustainability of companies. Lots of companies are hiring now sustainability consultants or even having sustainability officers as permanent people on their staffs to help guide them um, in those practices. Um, pretty much anyone from any field, um, if they've got a bachelor's degree, can go on to master's programs in sustainability. There are lots of sustainability master's programs right now that focus on different um, subfields within sustainability. Um, and that's an option no matter what you got your bachelor's degree in. Um, if you're a person interested in going to law school, there are lots of wonderful opportunities with environmental law. That's a really fast growing field. And also with education. Um, so school districts are interested in incorporating environmental science and sustainability into their curriculums. There's been a huge increase in how much is being offered at colleges and universities in these fields. So there's opportunities to teach there. And also something that's interesting is that state and federal um, government agencies are now employing um, educators that can talk to the public about environment issues, sustainability, much like what we've been doing for years with public health, where we have educators in public health that address the community and try to promote knowledge and health. So there's just a ton of just so interesting things um, going on with careers right now. Um, and so if you're interested in getting involved in that, you know, um, talk to your academic advisors, talk to the wonderful people at Career Services. Um, let's see, at Elmira College, we've just started a minor and a major in environmental science and also a minor in sustainability. Um, it's Dr. Trevor Browning and Dr. Um, Doc Billingsley that are um, in charge of those programs. Both wonderful people, very easy to talk to, would love to, of course, have interest, interested students talk to them about those programs. Um, and, and just a final word of advice, um, looking for summer internships is a wonderful way to get started. It's a little bit late for this summer, but in the fall, that's when summer internship opportunities start to be announced. Um, so, you know, look around, you know, if you're interested in a career in the green economy, sustainability, look at what's available for internships. It's a great way to kind of try on a career for a summer, see if you like it, you know, um, make some contacts and, you know, start to grow your experiences. Um, so that's what I have prepared for you all for today. Um, and of course, I'm happy to answer any questions when we do the question and answer um, part of this. I believe all our hands have now spoken, so we are now going to open it up for conversation. So pretty nonchalant here, but any questions that you may have for panelists, panelists, if you want to talk a little more about a certain topic, um, students, this is now your time to really get involved in the conversation. Um, so any questions or things that you may have, um, if you want, might as well, if you type those in the chat. The questions or comments. Yes. <laughs> I have a question uh, on, well, I wanted to talk about uh, green jobs. Um, in Florida, when I, I, will, I am from Florida, so there I saw a lot of solar panels and solar winds and all those kind of things, which are very good to generate electricity in most 
houses in certain parts have those uh, solar panels. I was wondering how much they are sustainable in other states who do not have the same kind of temperature, same conditions, same sunshine for that matter. Um, Mm -hmm. like I've seen it pop up in several different states. Um, I think this kind of gets into like, like the education that you were referring to, right? Of education, educating the public, but also there has to be a public push for it, right? Like there has to be a demand for things to happen, for change to happen. Um, I know I lived in central Pennsylvania for the last seven years. Um, solar panels are huge there. Mm -hmm. And it's the Buffalo River Valley, you know, like it's there's it's more mountainous, um, probably similar, very similar to here, very successful there. Um, you know, I think probably in Central America or Central America, in the middle, middle America, mm -hmm. <laughs> North America, United States, right? Like we know that that wind is, is a big piece there too. Mm -hmm. But I think from what I've seen and, and Certainly our scientists can probably speak to this a little bit better, right? I think part of it is that shift of like, we have to try, right? Like we have to get, as a public, we have to say, we're gonna try this first. And then the scientists come in and they consult and they decide, yes, we think this will work. Maybe this won't work. We have to adjust our, our windmills because of airflow, right? Um, but there has to be a buy-in for mm -hmm. that to happen. I know in Nevada, uh, solar, which is my home state, solar is huge and you can get, uh, um, there's incentives mm -hmm. to switching to solar, right? If you get panels for your house, you switch to, um, you know, water heating systems that rely on solar power. Um, it can be very worthwhile for people. Um, but I, I lived in the Middle East for a time in a country called Kampar, which is very sunny and very hot year round. So you think be perfect for solar energy. And it's a it's a country that is very wealthy based off gas, right? Um, reserves. And so there was some talk of switching over solar, but what they found was that even though it's very, very sunburnt as a country, it's also very dusty. And the solar panels would quickly become filled with dust. And so that would require another layer of complexity about who's going to come out and clean this off. Or that's a whole other industry there alone. So it's interesting because it's not always a one blanket solution. Um, one of the cool initiatives that I was reading about is in Sweden, and there's a word in Swedish that I don't know. It is vindovindar. It means women and wind, and it's a co-op only owned by women. And so what they do is members can contribute whatever they can afford. So it can be, I think it ranges from $70 to $46,000, but whatever their contribution, they can equal say. And they get an equal share in the company. And so um, this has been doing wonders to boost the local rural economy, promoting clean energy, and also opening up the market. And so there's some ways that entrepreneurships um, and investments in women-run leadership in clean energy have been very successful. Um, as I said, women are down an underused um, resource. Yes. I just want to add one more thing to it. I think we can also utilize nuclear energy. Uh, my sister, who is a space scientist, I was talking to her ab about this. That can't we utilize nuclear? Because they use that for power and as a, as a fuel for the space uh, missions, you know, the space aircrafts that go into the space. Uh, so why can't we use that instead of using the gas or, or you know, solar energy where it's not, you know, sustainable? And she said, yes, we can, but nobody wants to do it. So maybe nuclear energy, which is very clean energy, it's not going to cause any problem. We can use that for um, power generation. We can use that for, for transportation. Um, I think that's something which, which, we, which scientists, I mean, that's not in my hand, but scientists should look into and try to come up with effective ways how to harness that and use it in an environmental friendly way. Yeah, lots of nuclear power plants have been shuttered in the U.S. You know, there's um, the aspect of them generating, you know, this this clean, huge amount of relatively clean energy, but then the waste can be tough to deal with. Um, and yeah, there's just been a shift away from it. Um, you know, um, really where there's a lot of growth in the green energy sectors with wind power. I was looking the other day at 
the jobs that are growing the fastest in the green economy and you know wind um, turbine turbine engineer is like way at the top of you know one of those jobs that's just there's a huge demand right now um so i think they're really you know in the us there's been this shift where we're doing a lot more with solar wind you know continuing to maintain our hydroelectric hydroelectric is huge in new york state you know we get a lot of energy from that um yeah and i agree like nuclear energy is can be amazing but yeah i'm not sure all of the levels of detail that go into why that industry has been coming down but it definitely has in the u.s i i'm not equipped to speak to that because i don't know very much but again i'm from nevada <laughs> which was the site of the yucca mountain nuclear repository um and what i found is that generally poor communities rural communities are the ones that are usually kind of used for the dumping of any <laughs> unwanted materials including yucca mountain right mm -hmm. that was something that um, community members are very upset about, but we also have a history of nuclear testing in the state, right? Where we still have contaminated groundwater, we have a lot of downwinders, including my own family as well. My grandfather and his entire work team died of radiation exposure and we're getting that at test sites. But that's something else. That's not nuclear energy, right? That's nuclear testing. I will say that um, education is super important because I don't know what the real risks are versus the perceived risks. We have this funny thing as humans. We have these certain perceived risks that terrify us. For example, flying an airplane, right? My husband is terrified of flying. He's terrified, but he gets in his car and drives quite happily every day. The risk of dying in a car accident is so much higher than the risk of flying the aircraft, but the perceived risk is greater in his mind because there's a sense of not being in control, and it's also, you know, sort of more a dramatic type of ending, whatever part of his brain he's latched onto it. And so when it comes to the risks of some of these energy sources, I would want to know what are the real actual risks compared to the perceived risks versus the current risks that we're already facing. It may very well be that there are real risks related to nuclear energy, especially for those vulnerable communities, which is definitely something to think about. Um, but is it going to be larger than the risks attached to the inevitable changes in the climate mm -hmm. and pollution that we're already facing? And I'm, I'm going to throw a question to our students, get them to talk a little bit. So, um, I just say maybe if we could just kind of go around the room and, and just have everybody, um, you know, tell us what your major is and what careers you envision yourself going into and whether you think um, anything having to do with what Dr. Paulson has talked about, the green economy or um, sustainability or any of those things that do you see that as being sort of part of your future? So, we can start with anybody. Well, uh, the people on the people, on, yeah, and the people on the <laughs> I'm not gonna forget them. So yeah, perfect. I can start off. All right, guys. Um, my name is Maria Antonio. I am triple majoring in child education, special education, and English literature. Um, and after hearing everything that we discussed already this morning, um, knowing that I can have a direct impact with our future generations coming up, teaching them like the simple reduce, reuse, recycle, the difference between trash and recycling, um, things like that directly impacting them at such a young age and help solve these problems moving forward. Um, I can go next. I'm Bella Gamea. I'm a childhood and special education double major with concentration in biology. So I think being able to teach students like the impact that climate change has, like in the biology perspective, can also help bring them up. Really. Um, I'm a major. Uh, I still go to med school. Uh, I'm Sophie. I'm also a bio major, and I want to be a dentist. So I don't know much about this stuff, but it's pretty cool to learn about. I guess there's little things I can do, like not throw trash outside. And only I learned what biodegradable was when I was young, and I stand by that. Now you can throw a banana peel out the window of the car, but not a gun after, right? That's the rule. That's what. That's like that's my baseline knowledge of uh, being good for the environment. But I don't know too much more about it. I think that's going to come up in a couple of the other panels later today too. Is like some of these like these industries that there's a lot of waste. Right, and we have to for health reasons. Mm -hmm. But what are the little changes you could make? Uh, what are the little things that you could do? Even like, if you're going to be a dentist, maybe you'll own your own practice. What what decisions could you make, even to not print everything? Right, like what does that look like? And and that's using other industries too. So, hopefully, you'll go to some of these other panels too. <laughs> 
in biology, you know, you did that and you know, you're always like an anesthesiologist to nutrition. I don't even know much about like climate change, <laughs> like all that stuff, but it just seems good. To, like, I always recycle this stuff in my mess, like my little part to help out instead of just throwing trash in the way. Like, it's definitely going to be like what I like. Um, I'm like speech and hearing. I want to be an SLP either in a school or kind of practice. So. Oh, absolutely. I'm currently looking at internships. Rich was helping me. I'm a finance major. I don't really know what I want to do yet, but I'm kind of open to looking at anything. So possibly maybe in the green sector. I'm David. I'm a bio major. I have four points in my mind. I think physical therapy. But I have a year. I'm going to go home and work and just think about just all the possible career choices I have. And right now, I'm obviously picturing something in green energy, but it's difficult. I'm a child of special education, so I'm sure I'm not sure you did math. Um, I don't think you teach younger students, so I think I should really get strong from this and get as much as possible on this topic. So I, I guess what the what they were focusing to interesting going to med school. And uh, I, I, I think you're right that there was like two three that are free health maybe. Um so I, I don't know, maybe perhaps you could do you, would you have any um insight into how the discussion on climate and the environment might impact the medical school experience, but maybe even in terms of the curriculum or other things that you know maybe 20 years ago wouldn't have been a consideration. Is that question for me? Yes. yes. Okay, so I, I'm I was having a hard time understanding the question. Okay, so I was wondering if you could follow up on a few of the students who um uh, major, yeah. Yeah, who, who are planning on going on to medical school. Um, and whether you from your own experience, how you know, how has that experience changed as a result of having to deal with climate change, climate mitigation, um, or you know, any anything like that. Yeah, I mean, in the context of COVID, uh, these past two years have been difficult, just like anybody else. Um, but for the students who want to get into the medical school, uh, what we look usually at, their pre of course, the grades and the AMCAT scores, but also what they have done, if they are uh, volunteering, um, if they have worked for any kind of organization which has helped for the climate, or if they're working in a hospital in some capacity, what kind of experiences do they have outside of college? It could be the hospital volunteer work. It could be the climate related work. It could be anything uh, which shows that they have gained some experience as a paramedic, as an EMT, whichever one. So, so that's what we usually look at other than their grades and MCAT score. Have you seen a, have you seen a change in the curriculum? in medical school based on things that are happening in climate change or the experiences that people have? Yeah, that is something we need to add. I think, no, I haven't seen, I've been teaching since 1985. I haven't seen any change in the curriculum in the medical school regarding climate. They should, they should uh, do, they have an environmental science course, I think mandatory. Uh, they should change that to the curriculum. Um, yeah, no, I haven't seen any changes particularly. Question. I've been concerned about um, subtropical diseases working their way into the US with climate change and are medical professionals being alerted to look out for things that might be moving, you know, northwards that, you know, wouldn't have been a concern previously, but now might be, you know, cropping in and making people sick or are things just going undetected because we're not really looking for these things. Like what's going on with that? Well, uh, on the medical front, CDC and the NIH, they're always looking for these kind of uh, diseases, these viruses. Uh, we always keep a watch in different countries what's going on, whether they're getting vaccinated in general, not for COVID or any kind of pandemic, but in general, how they are. 
because any mutation anywhere across, if it's happening, they have the reservoir, then of course it's gonna come to us. So we're always on the lookout, but again, you know, not everyone is on the same page and the politics happen and things get out of hand. And sometimes it results in disaster, which happened two years ago. But yes, we are always on the lookout for it. Good to hear. <laughs> I work with a lot of medical schools who are applying for residencies in the US. So I, I have a, um, I'm like an editing consultant with Wolf Cornell Medicine. And so I get a lot of students from you know, other countries, especially in Qatar, um, in that region, who are applying for residencies in the US. And they tend to have a pretty high um, exposure to global health. And so I've noticed that a lot of the students who are now applying for residencies have had more experience with um, migrant populations. There's a lot more migration because of some of these changes right. we talk about. I would expect that to continue to rise. Um, specific health issues tied to certain disasters. I mean, um, like in Bhopal, for example, where there's this massive pesticide catastrophe, not related really to climate change, mm -hmm. but multi-generational impacts, you know, in this community. Um, so I know of students who have been drawn towards serving certain populations as a result of some of these rising issues, um, even like with the recycling of electronics, e-wastes, um, the workers who are in tasks with that, and again, coming back to gender, usually women are the ones who have that riskiest, lowest pay, bottom of the hierarchy, um, being able to, when you take apart electronic to recycle the precious metals, um, the workers who are doing this, um, in India, for example, um, don't have the proper tools or equipment. And a lot of times they'll have to use like an acid bath, like strip down the metal. And so of the 14 hazardous chemicals used in that process, half of them affect women's reproductive health specifically. And so again, you also have women and children um, who are being affected. And so I've known students who are interested in working with specific populations to help mitigate some of these problems um, in their line of work. So something, I just want to toss that in. <laughs> Any questions from our online people, please feel free to put that in the chat. I mean, we have a lot of bio majors here, so you can ask if you want to get into medical school, you can ask me the questions. <laughs> <laughs> it's an opportunity. <laughs> You have questions about residency statements. You can talk to me. And, and even the residencies, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I could only answer writing questions. <laughs> yeah, so, um, I'm the coordinator for first service. <coughs> um, I've lived in the community for 45, 37 years. Um, I've definitely seen an increase going back to the solar conversation of within the past like three to five years, really large farms in the area that were dairy farms are now solar panel farms. Mm -hmm. And um, going towards the Rochester area, a huge increase in the wind turbines. Mm -hmm. And um, it, it's really interesting to see even in our, our local area, how that impact is changing and how um, some of those industries are changing. So it, it definitely doesn't have to be a um, Nevada or a Florida kind of uh, environment. It's nice to see that we can make impacts and changes locally and that they affect the, the greater good. Mm -hmm. um, and I just, I just want to follow up on something that Rachel mentioned earlier when um, she was giving her talk, um, her introduction, where I think Rachel, we talked a little bit about the, some of how the change is driven by consumer demand, right? So consumers um, advocating or wanting to see certain types of things reflected uh, in that, you know, due to their preferences. Um, and I think for any of the students, I know there are a few of you in the room here, perhaps who are uh, pursuing uh, business or finance or any of those industries, um, it's, I, there is another opportunity also to um, look for ways in which you can kind of enhance your skill set because some of these companies are, you know, they're, they're almost creating sort of a, like a little niche uh, area for themselves where they attract consumers that are very environmentally uh, conscious and they want to see some of these sustainable practices and they care about how their clothing is made and um, you know, what, what's the carbon footprint that the company has, et cetera. So you know, all the way from the company's marketing and branding, advertising, all the way down to production, um, the way in which the products are made. So um, I, in fact, I think in our, in our new, um, 
So the business uh, administration program just created a new minor in fashion merchandising, fashion marketing. And we have courses specifically in there relating to sustainable practices in, in clothing and fashion. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, if you go back 20 years ago, that would not even have been a subject area. Nobody would have been talking about it. So it's, again, it's kind of like an example of, you know, that sort of structural change that is going to um, percolate, not just, as Abby pointed out, not just in areas like, you know, the STEM areas that you think about, but in literally every avenue and area that you can think of. Um, so there's just something to sort of keep in mind as you, as you, you know, kind of specialize in whatever careers you're going to end up in. I actually have a friend who started a company in the Philippines, which is where she's originally from, that takes um, discarded clothes, mm -hmm. right? Clothes that cannot really be recycled through a thrift store, for example, because it's just in too bad of shape. And that clothes just kind of fills landfills, right? Because you can scrap fabric. Taking scrap fabrics and recycling them in bags and employing local women to do the bag making and paying them a fair wage and then yeah, selling it to consumers. That was a really cool, I think that was an amazing company idea. Um, and they're very cute bags too. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's a there's a classification if you've ever heard of e corporation. Have you guys heard of these? It's there's there's a it's a whole guide of, of standards that you have to meet. And it's for sustainable practices, but also for humanistic, right? So are they paying a fair wage? Like and, and you hit that certain level, you you earn a B corporation. Um I mean, you, you earn that status and it's reviewed regularly. And that's something where, you know, even as a consumer, as a consumer or as someone who's looking for a job, you know, in certain industries, you may look and say, like, I want to work for that because that could be the gold standard, right? Where, again, you can be consumers of products, but you're also consumers of labor, if that kind of makes sense, right? Where you guys, you do get to choose. And that's why I say there is privilege in that. And I think our other panelists have spoken to that too. Right, we don't all have equal opportunity to. Yep, I can move here, and I can do this, and I can be really selective. Um, my goal for you is, as you as you gain more experience, that you'll have that confidence and that ability to do that. But that's where even like the little changes of, like I said, if you if you own your own practice, what are little things that you could do? Um, or if you're going to, if you're looking at medical schools, if, if it's really important to you to say, does this one have sustainable practices, and this one doesn't? But they're pretty similar otherwise. If it's really important to which one do you choose, right? And, and similarly for, for companies, you can push this kind of back on them a little bit of what are your values? And again, we're here for the climate teaching. So <laughs> it may or may not be one of your values. Hopefully it is. Um, I imagine if you're if you're here and listening to this, it's probably something that is important to you. Um, but but we have values, you know, uh, that run the gamut. But the things that are important to you use those things to drive your decision making um, as you go forward because they're important to employers and to industries and to producers of products as well. I want to share one piece of advice that I give to my writing students, which is that even the tallest mountain, this is a cliche, I could say it's not advice, it's a cliche that I recycle. Even the tallest mountain can be climbed one less at a time. So when you're writing your paper, when you're sitting on a project, don't think about the whole huge thing, like, oh my gosh, I've got to write 20 pages. Focus on the first itty bitty steps, little teeny tiny steps, and you do them and they'll get you there. And it's the same thing with change, especially with climate um, change and sustainability. As you're moving into your careers, as you're taking each step up, I always think to myself, okay, each step up, what, can I look back? And can I help someone else get the step behind me that I just left? Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So kind of like as you're reaching up, also don't forget to look back and reach down and help lift others as well. And that, that's how we create a better world in general. All right, so I have a quick question. Is sustainability of a priority for government? Is sustainability a priority for companies? For like the policy making and the government. Because I feel like that's where it all stands. Like if they're not going to change, nothing else is going to change. If no jobs are going to come, big oil is still like in the front. Yeah, well, definitely, you know, I think that this is something that's coming up with lawmaking and policy. You know, the biggest thing I can think of recently, maybe you guys know more about this than I do, is, you know, the attempt to um, have a Green New Deal where there would be federal support for, you know, increased 
you know, job creation and green energy fields and support for companies to be more sustainable and everything that goes along with that. You know, that was defeated in the um, Senate a couple of years ago, but there are, you know, pushes in smaller ways to get legislation through to try to, you know, increase the environmental standards of what we're doing in the country. You know, we're part of the Paris Accord, which is an agreement, you know, with multiple companies, with multiple countries to work together to try to bring down carbon emissions. So, you know, there is a lot going on at the government level. Um, you know, there's always this battle between people that want to do the right thing for the environment and people that feel like the right thing for the economy might not match with that. But I think that there's a growing, like, middle population that is saying, hey, we can do both. We can do the right thing for the environment and it can be economically viable. It can make companies more profitable. And you know, there are ways to do this. So I think that there's you know work going on at the government level just to support stuff like that. And certainly more companies are being more cognizant of what they're doing and their impacts. I think there's a tendency to sort of look for top-down solutions, mm -hmm. right? Because there are these figures of power and authority and we're kind of waiting and expecting something to come down from that end, right? And it's also a very American way of thinking <laughs> because we're a very top-down society. But real change tends to come really from a more horizontal perspective, from communities, right? This is why grassroots movements are so important. But even looking at local governments, so I talk about mayors, looking at a city level. For example, Barcelona, okay, had its first female, I think first female mayor, first feminist government that decided specifically to improve the city for women. And one thing they did was they made some changes to parts of the city streets and moved them into the block planning. The reason is that men and women use cities differently. Men tend to use cars because they travel by car for work and leisure. Women tend to work closer to home. They tend to have more diverse movement patterns because they go shopping, they pick up the kids, they take care of their parents. And so they tend to rely more on public transportation. And so a city that's very car-centered is already exclusive, being exclu exclusionary of women's needs make it more difficult for them to use the city in the space they need to. So when Barcelona's rule was redesigned, it created a, like they blocked off these um, streets to make like a super block. And that center was uh, friendly for, for pedestrians, for strollers. They also redesigned bathrooms, public restrooms. There's like a lot of little changes you can make on a local level that can actually make a pretty big difference. And so designing a city that's better for women also tends to be designing a city that's better for the environment. Just interestingly enough. So who you vote for matters, and it's not always on the large scale political level, it's also on the micro community level as well. Mm -hmm. I, mean, I just want to say one thing, I know we're probably really close to running out of time, uh, but kind of just following up on your question and Abby's response and Autumn's response to that, um, I, I, I think what you were trying to get at is that, uh, you know, which, what we've seen is that the political party that in power makes a difference, right? Um, based on whatever beliefs people might have. And so one way to ensure change and to, is, is certainly to make your voice heard and to vote for the things that you believe in, right? Uh, but also as Otto pointed out, um, you, you don't have to wait for legislative change. Um, a lot of change, one of the benefits, I mean, you know, capitalist economists get a lot of uh, uh, negative press, but one of the benefits is that companies in the search for profit will also be um, pushing for things that their consumers want. So if consumers, you know, there's an the expression in economics, I'm not using it correctly, but consumers vote with their dollars. So if we're going to be buying products that um, we want to see as being environmentally sustainable in the way in which they were produced or the impact that we have on the environment, companies will produce them. And, and and companies have a lot of power in this country. Um, and so uh, sometimes that's the way in which, you know, change can happen more so than waiting for the legislative process to kind of catch up with people's, you know, preferences. Yeah, I just want to add to that. You're absolutely right. Um, companies have a lot of power and we tend to overemphasize the importance of government a lot in everything. I think young minds like the audience we have today and entrepreneurs, those who believe in climate change, uh, they can make a difference. So it has to come from bottom up, not top down. So I totally agree.
Well, at this time, we are at 11.41. Um, so if there's not any more questions, panelists, is there anything else you want to add? Perfect. So just a reminder for students and for faculty, um, we do have the environmental fair in the campus center and then the low impact meal option in the dining hall until two. And then there's also the environmental upcycling flea market. Um, oh, sorry, that's the one that's until two. It's this flea market until two p.m. behind the energy project. So thank you all for coming. If you haven't signed the sign in sheet here, you're going to do that up here. Okay. Thank you everyone for joining me online and have a great day. Thank you.